especially need to know basis telling you that we are going to have a session that you will remember for a very long time. The man sitting on my right, Mr. Ranade, is not a public personality, he's certainly not a page three person, but possibly an individual who understands in great depth the strategic challenges our nation faces specifically with the neighbor in the north. This is an important session when Anurag invited me to participate in this event. I felt very honored that I had this opportunity because since I had read this book cover to cover, I was extremely worried. What the book brings about are all the issues that our nation's highest leadership should be taking into consideration in cabinet meetings after cabinet meetings. Mr. Ranade's introduction is brief, but his experience is at great length. He has served the nation overseas and in India. Sir, my first question is a very leading question. We often hear that this is going to be India's century. But is it going to be India's century versus the century for the Chinese people? Or is it going to be a challenge between these two countries? Bowen, first let me thank you for the kind words you said. Um, and let me also amend your uh, interpretation a little bit when you said that the book left you very worried. Very worried. The idea was to alert you, okay. not to scare you. Okay. <laughs> uh, unless you are aware of the challenges, it's difficult to tackle them. As to your question about whether this is going to be India's century or China's century or whatever, I believe in um, one maxim, which is that no rise is inexorable. History has shown that there is a cycle. Whatever goes up has to come down. And I think India is on the right track. Our trajectory is good. Uh, we are moving in the right direction. There have been hiccups. In fact, there have been brakes applied on the way in the form of COVID, etc. But I think we have come out stronger. Some of our systems have shown uh, that they are capable of dealing with it. Similarly with China, they've had a good run till now. They have been trumpeting the fact that their system of governance is far better than ours. Or, for example, or in fact, for that matter, better than the democratic world. I contest that, and I'll tell you why. But uh, I think China is now getting into difficulty. Its uh, growth rate has dropped. Chinese economists, some of them put it at negative. Some of them say it's about 1.5. Officially, the Chinese are talking about 3%. Some of their well-wishers abroad are talking about 4 to 5%, but they're in deep trouble. They've slashed the salaries of their employees at the center and provinces by 30%. And that's not something that's going to make, make the employees very happy. They've withdrawn the bonuses that they paid last year. There is mounting unemployment. Graduate unemployment, and mind you, we are talking about a country where there's a one-child policy, mm. is at 20%. So they're heading into a lot of problems. And I think with the world sentiment being what it is, which is negative on China, particularly after COVID, they're going to find their traditional markets in the United States and the West get closed off to them. That leaves us in a dominant position. So I don't know whose century it's going to be, but I certainly feel that we have a very good run in front of us, and uh, we should reach uh, where I think most of us, at least in this room, hope to reach uh, within another, another few years. Thanks, sir. That's encouraging. Uh, we have 4,000 odd um, uh, miles, kilometers of uh, border with them. And since 1962, when they objected to certain outposts that we were putting out there, they've always created problems on them. 
we have had issues very recently and they have turned into gruesome fights. Do you think uh, the Chinese government will ever come to some kind of an agreement on any of those border issues to their satisfaction? Will we be ever able to solve these problems? I think ever and ever are very difficult uh, words uh, to contain, but I don't see the Chinese government wanting to settle a problem with us. They are today in a, shall I say, a race for dominance of this part of the world, where we are an obstacle. We are the, probably the largest country which is uh, standing up. We stood up to them at Doklam. We have blocked them now in Ladakh. They don't want that. Not only that, uh, right from the beginning, I think we've misunderstood the Chinese designs and we've probably not shaped our responses properly. They have not looked for a partnership in this part of the world. They have looked to dominate. Mao said that very clearly. Some of us still say there is enough space for the two countries to rise together. Rationally, logically, that is so. But the Chinese don't look at it that way. They say there can be only one tiger on the mountain top, and that is the Chinese. So we're looking at a difficult time. And let me just end by saying that at the party congress, which was held in October this year, it's a once in a five year event. It's the event where they review what they've done and what they're going to do. There, the stage for the India China relationship was set very clearly. When the clip of the clashes at Galwar hmm. were shown on the opening day of the Congress. Just to put that in context, let me say that at, on the opening day of the Congress, you had the top leadership, political leadership, and the official leadership of China present, their military leadership present. So the signal that was sent out to the almost 5,000 people present was that the relationship with India is going to be symbolized by that clip. It's not going to be a good relationship. It's going to be one that is confrontational, if not worse. Sir, in your book, in your, the, the, you've edited the book, but uh, the article you wrote, uh, chapter you wrote on China, you bring out the facts about their military power and how they're trying to become a global military power. Now, having said the thing about the clip, I don't know which particular clip they saw. Maybe they saw a clip which favored them but the clips that have been around on Indian uh, social media have showed us doing a fairly good job of what it should be done. Given that background, China having one child policy, do you think the Chinese military is that keen on a war-like situation or that capable of fighting a nation like ours? The clip that was shown, as you said, obviously is something that they Favors, would do. Favors, They're very good yeah. propagandists, yeah. so they would have done that. But whatever it is, the fact is they showed a clip of a conflict, yeah. uh, and that is not a good thing. But uh, coming to what you said about a one-child policy and the, their armed yeah, forces, capability to fight their war. armed forces haven't been tested in battle. The last time they fought was in 1979 with Vietnam, where they got a bloody nose. After that, there has been no real fighting. There have been little... Uh, standoffs yeah. with us, that's about it. Um, and we really need to question whether they have the stomach for a fight. Mm -hmm. At the moment, they're standing up and they're bivouacking in the heights of Ladakh. But can they withstand a battle is the question. Their tenures in the high mountains are about one year, mm -hmm. maximum one and a half years. Our Soldiers, on the other hand, have been battle-tested. They're battle-tested regularly, either in JNK or, or with the Chinese or whatever, uh, or sometimes on internal duties. So um, they're seasoned men, and uh, that is one thing we'll have to see. The second is that their leadership system is different. It's uh, still a system where the soldier has no initiative, they are now building up their NCO level, so the middle uh, backbone of the army, which we have, they don't have. They are still trying to build it. So they have technology, or claimed technology, mm -hmm. but we don't know how it's going to go. What we need to be worried about is actually their cyber capabilities. Yes. 
yes. and what they can do, how they can cripple us. As I was saying, we are going in the, on the path of digitalization, but we don't have the resources as far as hardware is concerned, cyber hardware, which we are still importing. So that's a vulnerability that we have. But I think uh, looking at this on balance, I have stated the factual position of the Chinese armed forces and ours uh, to alert people of a possibility. I personally feel that if we adopt a situation where we are not defensive, where we decide to also take certain offensive actions, maybe pinpricks, whatever it is, uh, the balance will be offset. So I have confidence that if uh, push comes to shove, uh, it will certainly not be as they, everyone has been saying, it will not be 1962. Right. Uh, but uh, since China is a major power, even if we are able to give them a small bloody nose, it will dent their image Im immeasurably. And that for us would be a victory. Sir, but in your book you write about all these villages being built on the border, railway lines being drawn up from Lhasa to all over the place, and then airports coming up which are of multi-use possibly, defense also. So with that kind of infrastructure, where is the response from India at the border level? How good are we or do you think there is scope for stuff? Could you advise the government to do things that they haven't done? Uh, we are moving very rapidly. Uh, from all that I hear, all that I see, uh, our, uh, we are trying very hard to build up our logistics infrastructure. But, uh, you know, there is a lag. The Chinese are far better off. For two, uh, for two specific reasons. One, the terrain on their side is flatter and easier. And the second, they've been at this for a longer time. And their speed of construction is very fast. We, for some reason, are not able to build roads or bridges with that uh, speed, uh, which they are. But uh, we have done a lot. And I would say that the gap has reduced. The uh, second factor is our ability to reach and stay on the heights. I think that is an offsetting factor. And third, while they may have the airfields, uh, their aircraft will not be able to take off from those airfields because they're all at high altitudes with the same payload that ours do. So we have an advantage there. But what they're going to try and do is throw larger numbers at us in try, trying to offset that advantage. But that is where the missiles, etc., will come in. The skill of the pilots will come in. So I won't say it's a very... Um, uh, alarming picture for us, but it's certainly one where we need to factor in what they have and try and catch up. Yeah, one of the things that uh, just struck me when I read your chapter was the famine, the world famine you talk about, uh, 20, 30, 35, around that period, and how China has already foreseen that and started occupying agricultural lands in Africa and other parts of the world and trying to contain the food grain situation for themselves, possibly the same kind of population at that time as us uh, 10 years from now. Uh, are we ready for that as a country if this sort of eventuality ever happens? This um, 2035 was a year, in fact, that a Chinese official pinpointed and warned his leadership uh, that they have to prepare for. They have started preparing for it. Um, but uh, let me say that um, Indian businesses have also started buying land abroad and they have bought, bought uh, large tracts in uh, Brazil and other places. So um, they are not the only ones who are doing it. Secondly, we are self-sufficient today in terms of grain and I think we will try and continue that effort. The Chinese have started importing grain a few years ago after having been self-sufficient. Uh, but that brings me, if I can digress yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, please go ahead to another factor that we need to worry about, which is that the northern area of China uh, is very arable and rich, but they have a shortage of water. And that is why when they talk about diversion of the Brahmaputra, they're talking about diverting it to the north. And that is something we need to sit up and take notice of. I know that some of our um, experts have said that there is more rainfall on our side of, of the uh, you know, once the Brahmaputra turns in to Arunachal. But then the point is, if the Brahmaputra is reduced to a trickle, how much will it will turn? 
and will the rainfall then make up for that loss? These are factors that we have to see. But in any case, it will affect about 600 to 800 million people in the Indo-Gangetic Belt. And the building of dams and... Uh, yes, yes. Uh, because our, uh, the Himalayas, as you know, yeah. are uh, young, uh, young mountains. Yes. So they're fragile. And uh, by putting up a dam, what happens in Joshimat is the kind of thing that we yes, will be seeing. Yes, yes. So what about the business side of things? We are constantly hearing that India is continuing its trade with China. We buy billions of dollars worth of electronics, other products, uh, so many things in the market. They still come from made in China label, you know, with that label. So are we uh, sort of... Uh, trying to create a manufacturing hub here, or are we still dependent on China for so many things that come into the market? And is the trade going to continue the way it is, irrespective of what happens on the border? Personally, I feel it's a matter of regret that uh, despite the Chinese having done what they did in April 2020, the trade has continued to escalate. At that time, it was the deficit, trade deficit was 70 billion. Yes. We are now almost touching 100 billion. Yes. Uh, regardless of what is going on there. And despite the fact that we are saying that there will be no normal relations till and uh, unless they withdraw to where they were before April 2020. But uh, when I look at the trade more closely, there are a couple of points I'd like to make. One, I think we as a nation and as a business community need to sit back and see what we can do on our own rather than importing. And here I talk, for example, about the APIs in the pharma industry. We were manufacturing them ourselves. Then we went there because it was slightly cheaper. Right. I think the regulators could have intervened there, but they didn't. But the fact is that we are quite interlinked with the Chinese uh, now. They are manufacturing, we are buying, and so is the rest of the world. So to distance ourselves is going to take some time. We have started now putting up uh, factories here. We started looking at areas where we can come. That will take about five odd years before we can really start sh making a difference. The second thing is, the bulk of this trade deficit is because of the small trader. It's the guy who's uh, buying uh, Chinese bulbs, lampshades, etc., right, right. Ganpati idols, which could be developed here, which yeah. were being made here yeah, in our cottage industry. And because we have gone to the Chinese, we've in fact exacerbated our own unemployment problem. Yes. So that can be reversed. And here I think, personally, we need to think of some stricter measures yeah. to staunch the flow of Chinese goods coming in, at least these kind of goods, which are not vital. Maybe the a public service campaign time. to instill yes. you know, nationalism. Something like that. Yeah, something like that. Like or maybe some taxation by the government Absolutely. or something like Absolutely. that. Sir, something that uh, always uh, troubles us. China and Pakistan, two fronts, and their combination, and their current relationship, and this whole corridor business from Gwadar to China. How is that panning out? Is it, is it going to be a problem in the future? I think it's a problem already. Um, it is because of this China-Pakistan economic corridor that uh, Gilgit has been now made a province of Pakistan in order to safeguard the economic interests of the Chinese. Um, the fact that the China-Pakistan economic corridor goes through India-claimed territories uh, means that it's actually a question of our sovereignty. Uh, it's a challenge to our sovereignty. And the Chinese have done it uh, deliberately. Uh, by doing that, they have also taken a side. They've come on the Pakistan side, which they hadn't till now. There is a potential fusion of military forces of the Chinese and Pakistanis. That has taken place. Um, they've got set up uh, fiber optic lines of communication. They're linking railways. Uh, but more important, and I had a hunch that you might pick up on this, was the, uh, is that they have exchanged um, senior armed forces officers, senior military officers in their respective military operations directorates. So you've got a senior colonel of the Chinese army, that's a brigadier, mm -hmm. and a colonel slash brigadier of the Pakistan army in the other side's uh, military operations directorate, which means that there is much closer coordination than we can imagine. I mean, these officers are posted in addition to the defense attaché. So he's doing his job, but these are functional uh, posts. So I think it should be a source of worry. Plus, 
the Chinese are supplying a lot of things to the Pakistani. The nuclear uh, industry in Pakistan or nuclear reactors have been set up by the Chinese. The missiles have been manufactured by the Chinese. The aircraft they are manufacturing together is done by the Chinese. So there's a lot of worry. I mean, uh, the frigates have come in thanks to the Chinese. They're building three here and three in China. So uh, I think the military fusion that you're talking about has already started. The point is whether they will act in unison or not when the crunch time comes. And I think with the Western Theater Command shaping up the way it is, um, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. At the same time, sir, China is making inroads into Bhutan, Bangladesh, uh, Myanmar, obviously, and then uh, right up to Sri Lanka, and kind of encircling India from all ends. So is that a response in place, or is it ad adequate, or is it still in a planning stage? Or what would you recommend we do in a situation like that? But when we can't match the Chinese dollar for dollar. And uh, actually, that's what the Chinese are doing. They're throwing a lot of money to these countries. Nepal has switched that way. But Nepal is a different kettle of fish because the government there is a communist government. So they've already got some kind of a ideological alignment, and uh, which was not the case earlier. Uh, but I think we can rectify that. And we are trying uh, through, of course, uh, other methods. But um, as long as the country is a democracy, it leaves scope for change of the government. Same thing happened in Sri Lanka. Same thing has happened in Maldives. Maldives. So where the Chinese were, they're not good at playing the other side. They're good at getting into the leadership, paying them, and then uh, getting them to cooperate. But in the bargain, there is now uh, what is called the debt trap, which they've established. Yes. Other countries are waking up. Bangladesh has not fallen into it. So I think um, uh, we still have uh, options. We still have uh, cards to play, uh, which we will play. Uh, but um, you know, the basic hindrance that China is going to find is, uh, if I may call it, the uh, democratic attitude of the people in the region and uh, their religiosity. The Chinese cannot understand religion. You see the way they're treating their own ethnic minorities. So. I think these are factors that will ultimately, in the long term, go against China. So you m mentioned the clip that was shown at this uh, meeting. In the space of social media and overall propaganda, China has been successfully using, according to your book, the Confucius Institutes, and somehow playing up their role in the Indian media also. And we saw that when Doklam and Galwan and all those things happened. Where, is, where do they draw their strength from? W what can we do to counter that sort of uh, social media imaging of a country? Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that we are a democracy. Yes. We are an open country and we are an open people. Uh, you go and talk to someone on the street, he'll tell you his life story uh, at the drop of a hat. China is different. China is very regulated. They don't encourage intermingling between the Chinese and the others. The state controls everything. In fact, the state controls your um, WeChats or WhatsApps uh, and all communications. They delete messages at will. They are monitoring you now and grading you what your access is. They are monitoring is. themselves, right? They are not themselves. monitoring us, right? Themselves. So they, they are don't also have monitoring Google. us, but they are monitoring, monitoring them. Yeah. Uh, themselves. Covertly. But yeah. uh, in their own country, there is no Google. There is no Google. There is uh, no LinkedIn. There is no LinkedIn. Yeah. There is a WeChat. And which they yeah, have, I know. Facebook, and a way for Facebook, no. WhatsApp, no. nothing. So, but they are controlled, tightly controlled. So we don't have that scope of moving in, we are trying, but then, you know, it becomes a very narrow, individualized kind of effort. Right. Here, they have the freedom to beat our journalists, they have the freedom to beat our businessmen, they have the freedom to beat our politicians, and they are meeting. And they are trying to, if I may use, uh, well, an old word as, which I'm used to, they're trying to subvert them. A lot of them are uh, won over. A lot of money is paid. You'd be surprised to hear. People probably you're sitting with and dining with, you find that you know, they're probably um, receiving cash from the Chinese. So this is going on, and it can be done quite easily here. Uh, it can't be done there. I mean, it can be done, but not like this. So uh, if we are at 2023 now, and we have this whole seven years ahead of us till 2030, and there are these strategic challenges. Uh, 
China obviously is out there. Don't you feel the governments of the world today view China differently from the way they view India? And they are more favorable towards a democratic India, a rising India, and uh, possibly the most less threatening country on earth than the countries we just discussed. Uh, there would be an opportunity for us like never before, uh, because uh, in the post-COVID era, Indian talent has seen, been seen globally. We have, despite everything, managed to get 200 crore vaccines inside the bodies of Indians. It's, it's impossible probably for any other country to have an app like Coven, which works anywhere in the world. I have friends in the United States, and uh, they, they tell me their vaccination didn't work like that. Most of them have cocktails. You know, they don't even have uh, you know, individual va vaccines, and their cards are all kind of a problem. So we have demonstrated during this COVID period a capability which is very rare for our country. And uh, with that happening, and globally being recognized as a country which exported these vaccines. Now, aren't we in a situation that the world should favor us for whatever reason? Um, I can give you a straight answer to that one question of yours, which is definitely. Definitely. Uh, the world is looking at us quite differently. The world is uh, very suspicious of the Chinese. And in fact, large parts of the world are fearful of the Chinese. And uh, that is the dimension that uh, I think we will see it playing out in the next few years. Um, the growing tensions between the United States and China. Uh, China is dependent on the US and European markets. After COVID, those markets are going to shut down as far as China is concerned. But it's a struggle for supremacy for China to become the number one by 2049, as they have said. Yes. Rather foolishly, I think, why advertise what your end goal is? But they did it. The United States is now alert, and we are going to see a showdown between the two. What form it takes, I don't know. But the way I see it, it will probably be a clash over Taiwan. Okay. And uh, for us, that's a good thing. Uh, if we can get our, um, I call it enemy, I hope I'm not offending anyone here, but if we can neutralize them, uh, it's a good thing. And if someone does it, it'll be even better. So uh, I think that um, there is a benefit. The world is also looking to India for, as a manufacturing hub. Okay. Uh, so I think we are going to be in a good position. That's why I said that in the next few years, we should be uh, optimistic about the next few years. Thank you very much. So one last question before I let you go. This is a literature festival. And now, you know, you, you spent your lifetime in an arena of espionage, right? So we obviously know it's not like James Bond. But uh, who's your favorite writer when it comes to espionage world who comes closest to describing that space in fiction? Yeah. It's not like James Bond. Sometimes it can be. But okay. <laughs> uh, I would say John Le Carre is uh, probably Le Carre. the closest. Yeah, he is yeah. um, uh, very uh, realistic. Okay. Uh, of course, he gets too convoluted at times. Yes. Life is not always like that. And not every spy has a bad family life, as he paints it. <laughs> but um, yes, it's, I think he would be the closest. But um, let me tell you, it's a very interesting profession for I those who get into it. Yeah. So I missed it. So <laughs> not in this lifetime. But I'm sure there are people out there who want to contribute to our nation's defense, and they will look up to you as an inspiration. And uh, uh, so much has been done by the intelligence services that has never been reported, has always been in the back of the beyond. It's their failures which get highlighted. Their successes never get talked about. So this conversation can go on for next three hours because we have a unique situation here. Somebody who spent 35 years in the shadows now speaking publicly. But I have a restriction of time, and it says it's time's up. So we'll let it be. Is there any scope for questions from the audience? Well, I believe one question. Mr. Anade, sorry. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a, let me ask you very straight up. You know, I may I, not answer straight up. That's but okay. Yeah. That's okay. It's my job to do my job. Uh, you know, there is, a, there is a thought process in India from very credible people that we overestimate our capabilities with, with China. Medical sorry, military and economic both, right? 
even what was reported about Dokla, a lot of people take it with a pinch of salt. And you know what I'm saying. So do you really believe in, in your strategy you said the only way China will kind of wither away is self goals. You know, people don't like them, they're the bully, they don't have democracy, they're doing bad to Ugyars, all that. You know, it's like depending on they doing a self goal rather than we having a strategy. Right? So really, what, what should India do, which is not doing? And I'm not saying say all of it there, but give us one or two things which are realistic. Um, firstly, I don't think we are overestimating our strength. Uh, at least in the right quarters, there is a very clear appreciation of the Chinese strength and our strength. That is the first point I'd make. Secondly, we do not have the capability today of opening a full-fledged front with the Chinese, militarily. But that doesn't mean that we should accept what they do. Uh, they are a bigger power in terms of size, in terms of economic size, etc. They also have a huge uh, myth that they built up about their invincibility. But these are also opportunities for us. That if they uh, focus beyond a point, and I think they've reached that point, and if we retaliate, even if we take a small post, or if we block them somewhere, there will be a reaction inside China. Um, it will be a bigger defeat for them than for us, because we are a smaller power. And I'll give you one example. After Doklam, since you referred to Doklam, you're right that there are different interpretations of what happened in Doklam, etc. But what cannot be contested is that we blocked them and held them for 73 days. Post that, I mean, that's a different matter. We can discuss it offline. But uh, we held them. And the morale of our forces was much more, much, much higher than there. Especially they have one child policy. Exactly. So they're shying away from sending their from, children uh, to open. The, yeah. So that, all that is there. But when mm -hmm. Doak Club happened, when the 73 days ended through mutual decision for disengagement at the same time, there was an uproar in China. Hu Shichun, who is the editor-in-chief of Global Times, which is probably the most widely read Chinese newspaper in India because it's in English. Um, he's a supporter of Xi Jinping. And he said, what has happened? You were telling us that the army is so strong, you put in so much money. He's a supporter of it. He questioned it. Um, a lot of, um, you know, these, uh, what do you call them, tweets on the WeChat, etc., came uh, questioning Xi Jinping. And a rumor spread across China saying that Xi Jinping has bribed Modi and given him 20 billion yuan in order to get Modi to agree to a disengagement. This is what happened. And this was denied officially by the party, the Chinese Communist Party, by the Ministry of National Defense of China, and by the foreign ministry. Now, rumors don't fly just like that in China. Here we are pretty good at it, but not in China. And uh, for them to come out with three official denials means that it disturbed the leadership. They were not happy with it. Now. That is what I meant when I said it gives us a window to puncture that myth and to hurt them. And last, I just quickly, is China is opening up. You know, after, now China is, op you know, the first flight happened eight days back. When China opens up, it means it will clamor for resources. Resources meaning raw material, right? Which means the prices may go up because China buys in bulk in spite of it coming down. Which may again take the prices of everything up. You know, it's the same slice that it is buying from. So China opening up is good for the world or is it bad for the world? Is it good for India or is it bad for India? Apart from prices, the first worry that everyone has is COVID. Yeah. It that has, if that spreads, uh, it's not good news. And um, the Chinese have just opened up. I mean, suddenly, you know, overnight. Uh, they've also reacted to countries which have said RT-PCR tests will be required. So South Korea and Japan, they've stopped issuing them visas. But there is a thinking which says 
the Chinese experts have said, rather than bottling up, because then the mass immunity doesn't come. So if you allow it to go, reach a peak and you know, then come down. So that's their logic that we're trying to open up so that you know, it reaches. That is Again, the logic. It may, may not be true. No, that's the logic they have put out. Yes. Uh, to a point, maybe it is correct. But the real problem is their economic difficulty. Their um, logistics supply lines have been disrupted internally. The people are unemployment. I told you unemployment is rising. And they said that one way of handling it is to open up. And the second thing, which there is a rumor, I have no confirmed information, but it's a strong rumor inside China. Uh, the Prime Minister, Premier designate Li Chang, he is reported to have told Xi Jinping that if we don't open up, we'll be the only country which is closed and we'll be the laughing stock of the world. So let us open up before he takes over as Premier, which is in March. So uh, one doesn't know what has really happened. But I think there's a combination of factors, including the discontent among the people. And last comment is that if India is becoming better economically, which it is, there's no question. Even it's the only bright spot in the economy in the world, whatever. And that's not a political discussion. It is. Then China will do everything to destabilize India so that India does not really gain its position. So it's a cause for worry. Because India is growing. So China and it's take eating China's lunch, so to say. So China will do more and more to make sure India is always destabilized. I agree. In fact, I just wrote an article the other day which I was mentioning. And I would add to what you said by saying certainly they do it and we have to watch out for these two years, 23, 24. Because next year is our, ele our election year. As you can understand what the Chinese are up to. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arag. We can end on the note. Please buy more made in India than made in anywhere else. Thank you very much. <laughs>